Aloha and welcome to The Art of Life. I'm your host, Willow Chang Elion. We do broadcast live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. right here in the heart of Honolulu downtown. We went on a little bit of a hiatus for spring break. Sometimes we do that. Real life comes crashing through the door, but it's a brand new month and a brand new season, that being spring. And with spring brings many things, including change and renewal. And how apt is that? Since our guest today, Mr. Boyce Brown, has written one of many books dealing with education. And education is clearly the bedrock or the foundation of all things involving change, more or less. At least maybe growth. So, welcome. Thanks. Great to be here, Willow. Yeah, excellent. So, we're going to go into what all of us know as the origin story of our guest. That okay. is, how did you come to be, and what floats your boat, and all those good things. Well, first the earth cooled. <laughs> <laughs> and then the dinosaurs came, but they were too fat and stupid, so they turned into gasoline. And then the Arabs bought Mercedes Benzes. And, no. Uh, I wanted to be a novelist and a filmmaker as a young man, and got hired as a, at a charter school mm -hmm. in Texas. And uh, from there, stumbled into a career in education, education law, education administration. Uh, got a master's along the way, a PhD along the way, and. Now, 20 years into an education career, Goodness and I got gracious. my first book. So excited. Which we will discuss. But wait, you're a local boy. Break it down for us. Grown here, not, grown here, not flown here. <laughs> I thought about wearing my Kalihi shirt, the one with the old English lettering representing. But uh, yeah, Kalihi born and raised. Uh, went to a, a fine school that you and I and Obama went to. I don't to. know what you're talking about. Uh, it starts with a P. It's called the P school. <laughs> yeah. It, some people it's can't even say the name. I know. Wow. So I'm curious because one of the things that's very consistent with many of our guests here on The Art of Life is we have the idea or the ambition of what it is that we want to do. It's mm -hmm. not that that, is, that mission is aborted, but clearly something happens and drops in our lap or we take a different train or what have you, and then we're in a completely different career. And that is uh, what you had mentioned. So. Have you found, is there some similarities, do you think, between storytelling and writing books and education? Is there some continuity and, and thread amongst those topics? There is. Uh, we also sh went to s another school, Sarah Lawrence, together. Well, not together, at different times. But, I uh, didn't know that. Yeah. Are you following me? <laughs> you came after me. Are you following yeah, me? Yeah, that's right. But as you know, that's a really good writing school, mm -hmm. one of the best in the country. So I went there to be a writer, and then I realized, oh, wait, nobody reads. So then I transferred to UC Berkeley that had a really good mass communications program. And I really realized that mass media, the brain police, mm -hmm. and education are the two best ways to tell stories, but to change the world. And so I like to do both. That and was three things. <laughs> <laughs> but who's counting? And I've kept my art and writing, you know, fictional writing, memoir writing, and poetry mm -hmm. uh, at a kind of low simmer throughout my life, but it's never paid the bills. So <laughs> ultimately, you have to find something that does. And I don't know, they just keep hiring an education policy. So as long as the checks don't bounce, so I'll keep, keep in there. Educational policies. Let's break it down because I think. There might be several major times when people tend to think of education, capital E. So clearly when there's election, if anybody is prone to following politics, education yeah. is something that always comes up and it's like, right. oh, don't hurt the cakeys and you can't cut the budget and let's have you know preschools and things like that. Or they might talk about um, charter schools or giving funds to schools. So education uh, comes up in election year. That mm -hmm. might be once every two or four years, mm -hmm. depending on whether it's of importance. Or, or regarded as important. And then if you're a parent or a guardian, if you have a child, maybe it's deciding what school they're going to go to and attend and how much money you're going to allocate in your personal budget. Or right. if you yourself are in that process, you might be asking the same questions. But um, aside from that, talk to me about educational policy, because I think most people probably don't give much consideration to that at all. What does that entail? What does it mean? What is it? What is uh, it? The most obvious thing would be education law. Okay. For example, I'm working at the, the state capitol this session, and I'm studying, uh, or I'm 
participating in the K through 12 and higher education uh, law making that's going on there as an aide to Representative Matthew Lopresti. And this will be my seventh session at the Capitol and they've all dealt with uh, higher ed or lower ed law. Often as a writer of the laws, there's someone that actually has to do the writing of the laws and that has often fallen to me. But in more broadly speaking, it's the reports that are generated by the think tanks, it's the, the conferences where the, the ideas are germinated and brought to fruition, it's uh, the entire ideological complex surrounding education, I would say. Would you say that uh, under this type of heading, things like what age a child is that goes to school or what type of curriculum they have or what kind of credits or well, I mean, vouchers, like, fill it in because it's still, for me, really vague. And I want our, our viewers and myself to understand, um, uh, if you want to give us an example, perhaps, would that be like autonomy for the university? Would that be mandating that children under five have to go to some type of preschool? Is that something involved with maybe core curricula, like um, Common Core, I think is what it's called, which a lot of people are very, have very mixed feelings about? Like, what, what would be the policy? For example, so, all of those. All those things. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The answer is yes. <laughs> uh, I thought it was no. forty-two. <laughs> Who told you? <laughs> uh, well, we can center the discussion around this fine book. Excellent. Wait, let's sit. Let's get a little close up here, because yeah, there we go. It's a real life book, that ladies and gentlemen. That photograph is at the Philosophy of Education Society conference this year in Memphis. So you know you're real when you're in a conference book table. Fantastic. But this book is a history of standards-based education in America. And standards are essentially things that every child should know in every grade, in every subject. And that becomes a framework around which the lattice of the educational policy and system can be built. And that includes teaching, curriculum, professional development, mm -hmm. teacher training, uh, and all of the other primary components of education. So that's one way to conceptualize it, is to think of the main features in the system. So, yeah. I'm curious, standards. I mean, these things, obviously, they change throughout time for a very number of reasons. So. Let's say if you're in a community that has a, a bilingual population or maybe English is not their first language, I would think that standards might change or uh, might adapt to the community that it serves. It should, but it doesn't. It doesn't, okay. I think that education in America has traditionally been very decentralized for the 400 years of, of American education but it's becoming more and more centralized and the move towards standards is a part of that centralization. Previously, the, the Little Red Schoolhouse was serving the needs of that community mm -hmm. as the community determined it in a multi-age group, many grades in one schoolhouse. But with the advent of standards in say the late 80s, certain states started to do it and certain professional organizations like the, the group of English teachers, math teachers, social science teachers, they would all start creating model standards. And then by about the time that Bush, the Bush Jr. came into office, every state had standards. So there's no child left behind? Yeah, okay. and then he, about a year into his term, 2002, passed No Child Left Behind. And <clears throat> during his tenure, certain business groups, uh, Business Roundtable, Achieve, they started to push for even more centralization uh, under the mantra of college and career ready. And once they started establishing standards, that evolved into Common Core, which as you said earlier, is getting a lot of static lately. A lot of people are very unhappy with it. Right. And now 40, 41 states have adopted Common Core. In, there's Common Core in math and Common Core in language arts. So even though the states adopt it and the proponents of it say, well, that means it's state-led, 
Not really, because they were incentivized to adopt it by Race to the Top funding several years ago from the U.S. Department of Education. So in this sweep of the last 25 years, we've seen an absolute reversal of 400 years of decentralized uh, heterogeneous ed education policies that's community determined to a far more centralized uh, set of standards that interact with all the other components of education that I would say are largely created by big business and their agents and in college and career readiness are motivated by global competitiveness ideology and this is a such a radical shift in the function of American education. So let me see if I, if I can just throw some ideas out there. Because you're saying that this uh, motivation is basically money-based, as many things seem to be in today's sure. society. But when you had something that was community-based, you're able to assess what the needs are directly to the public that you're serving. Right. You can adapt and you can um, make changes and, and fluctuate with what's necessary. I don't think most people would argue that there's something wrong with standards. Standards certainly serve um, a providing a foundation of, of learning or basis from which you can build upon. I don't think anyone is arguing that standards shouldn't exist. But I'm hearing that there is a certain inflexibility which then uh, could possibly hurt the community that it's trying to serve. So I'm wondering, and I've read different articles about this, and it's interesting because they've said that overall America's, the pendulum has swung to this type of uh, common core standard-based learning mm -hmm. where people thought that maybe, and I'm going to go on a limb here, that Asian societies or their educational system was based, you know, factual and standards, but now they're attempting to do things that are more uh, creative, uh, creative and uh, problem-solving based uh, approaches and we're kind of going in the opposite direction. We have this type of dynamic going on. So what's your take on that in a, in a global perspective? Do you see that we're kind of going in the opposite direction of other uh, industrial countries or were we once leaders and now we've kind of our followers or what's your take on that? Well, we don't always do that well in international benchmarking studies on education. <clears throat> And a lot of the countries that do a lot better than us are not as reliant on high-stakes testing. And high-stakes testing is a crucial part of the, the many components of education that are held together by standards. And I think we need to understand that children learn in different ways. There's this theory called multiple intelligences by Howard Gardner, and people learn aesthetic, uh, people learn kinesthetically, mm -hmm. people learn visually, people learn orally, and people have different developmental stages, uh, as psychology tells us. And if you have standards, which sounds good, you know, who's, a f who's against standards? We all need standards. But when it assumes that every student is learning the same way and developing at the same pace, it doesn't allow for the differentiated instruction that can bring out the talents of each child. And that is done by good teaching, which is as much an art as it is a science, right. as we're, we're both educators, we both know. And if you de-skill the teaching, as we're de-skilling labor in so many other fields, then the teacher is teaching to the test, teaching to the standards, and can't uh, intuit on a minute-by-minute -minute basis what the student needs, which is what excellent teaching does. I couldn't agree more. You know, it's interesting because in pop culture, we've had these uh, movies when people actually would go and pay and see a movie, <laughs> or they would just download it for free. Um, Mr. Holland's Opus, or of course, uh, the Poet Society, and, yeah. and it was always these uh, very personality-based, driven, wacky rebels that like lead the kids to you know, fall in love with poetry or take a risk or play the sunset, what have you. But I think sometimes in the pursuit of great storytelling, maybe the bigger picture that was lost is that that dynamic between teacher and student, that ability to adapt, to make choices, um, to get through that student, whether that's the gifted, brilliant student that is completely bored with whatever the standards are, 
required, mm -hmm. or the person who is lagging behind, or maybe the student that is actually a good kid, but they've got hard things going on at home. I mean, your, your personal life and what's going on, all the stuff that we may not know about, and you just drop the kid off at school and you hope that they're going to function, you know, there's so many variables involved in the learning process. You said something that I thought was really interesting. You said uh, children learn in different ways. But I would just expand that to say that people learn in different ways. Yes. And, and I think that if we have this approach where we think that people are a certain type of learner and for the whole course of their life, you know, if someone says, oh, I'm a visual learner, and maybe that's what they gravitate towards or that's what they've been told or that's what they feel comfortable with, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But it doesn't mean that in some point later in life, maybe you become more of an oral person. Maybe your listening skills improve. Or maybe you find that you've developed a gift for writing. So I think that it's really important for both teachers and students to remember that. There's many roads to Rome. There's many ways to get there. But if you're encouraging or mandating that people have to teach a certain way with a certain set of things and a certain topic, you'll probably never be able to explore that in a classroom setting. I think that's true, and Captain, my Captain, I want to stand on this table right now to act <laughs> out Dead, Dead Poet Society, but I don't think it could that's strong support enough. My, my girth. <laughs> uh, but those movies speak to us because they speak to the great teachers that we've had, and we mm -hmm. both had a great teacher in Norman Henley. Absolutely. And hundreds of, hundreds of your viewers would say the same thing, because he and great teachers he knew how to pull it out of us, mm -hmm. and he knew that great teaching is the lighting of a fire and not the filling of a pail. It's not about depositing information into a vacant receptacle. It's about having them find their passion, their curiosity, their compassion, their desire for lifelong learning that can continue to grow and change in different ways that you spoke of. Hold that thought. Let's hold it right there. We're going to take that break. We want to leave you on a cliffhanger to find out more about the magic of teaching, <laughs> Boyce Brown, and the beloved Norman Henley. This is The Art of Life. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we, and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim. You've been here today, you've seen this, you've heard what she said, what do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back. This is The Art of Life. We're discussing 
the state of standardized education here in the Americas, North America to be specific, and our guest is none other than Dr. Boyce Brown. He doesn't put the doctor, but I did the reconnaissance, and he's just so like local style and all low-key like that. That's but, right. Yeah. Um, so we were giving praise to one of our favorite and influential instructors at Punahou, the late and the great... We are worthy! <laughs> we are worthy. The late and the great Norman Hindley, who taught English and poetry, among other things. But I would say, most importantly, he really was about the art of life. He was. Absolutely. And I think most of us have that one great teacher in high school, one great teacher in college. And as a teacher, if you can really reach one student, you feel like you've done a great semester. Oh, yeah. But I'm sure Henley, over his career, he's hundreds of students' best favorite teacher. Yeah. And that is a, an incredible legacy to leave. And it requires not teaching to the test, not being straitjacketed by standards and the way that standards being related to assessment, testing, curriculum. It just, you get more and more constricted. But, you know, I was thinking about Henley the other day. Mm -hmm. I still do. And uh, I think part of his genius was that if it was good, he told you. Oh. And you believed it. Yeah. It but wasn't, if it was bull, he would call you on that too. <laughs> if it sucked, he'd tell you that. Yeah. And so he had credibility. He, he wasn't just saying, oh, it all sucks. And then you, well, he doesn't like anything. Or, You're a winner. And then you don't... And a gold star for you and you and you. And you and you and you and you. We're all winners. So he had credibility, mm -hmm. which uh, was obvious to every student. And he had talent. I mean, anyone that wanted to be a writer could read his stuff and say, oh, yeah. I'm dealing with a heavyweight. I'd also add to that, which I think is the hallmark of a really excellent teacher, is that there's uh, the allowance of breathing room mm -hmm. for something that maybe personally doesn't interest you, but you can at least acknowledge that it deserves to be shared. So when a teacher can take an interest in something that doesn't necessarily personally interest them, yeah. that is fantastic. So if you're into short stories, but you have a student who's a really great long form uh, poet, and you're, you say, eh, it's not my thing, but my goodness, the work is great. You know, and how can I be of help? How can I be of service? That's really amazing. Or if you're a volleyball coach and, you know, you have someone who expresses an interest and they want to go into water polo, so be it. And to understand that that's not a reflection on you as a teacher and that shouldn't be a personal affront, but to understand that every person has a path and every person does have a calling and a passion. And maybe it hasn't come to fruition or maybe it has, but as a teacher, even as a parent, and we're all teachers, we all have the ability to be teachers at different point of our lives. It may not be how, what pays the bills, <laughs> and it rarely does, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's our responsibility, our collective responsibility to encourage that. And I feel like with this type of system that's being mandated, it doesn't really allow for that because you, te you treat a teacher like uh, an automated device or a system, and in turn, the students are treated the same way. It takes out the human experience of what learning is about, or even teaching. It does, because if you're so bound mm -hmm. to these mandates, these strictures, how are you going to cultivate uh, the passions of the student? And what, why do we have education? What is its goal? Is it to create college and career readiness in students? Okay, what does that even mean? College readiness, to be able to enter college without need for remediation. Career, what kind of career? We've hollowed out our manufacturing base, we've become mm -hmm. a, a service clerical based economy. What if, I'm just thinking out loud here. Uh-oh. What if? Seatbelt. Uh, there's philosophers of education like Nietzsche uh, and others that say we need to really let people uh, be lifelong learners in ways that can always evolve. But the concept of that, that they cultivate the concept of liberal education and not liberal in the partisan sense, but you have a diverse, well rounded array of things, of topics, and teaching methods and learning methods and you can change your path many times in life, even yeah. out of school. 
But if we're f constantly funneled back into this uh, narrow channels of standards-based education, then that's deleterious for the individual because it's going to limit their life opportunities, their creativity, their choices. And it's deleterious for society because it's being led by a global competitiveness ideology that assumes that an infinite amount of, uh, an indefinitely increasing population can use a finite amount of resources mm -hmm. in a rapidly uh, collapsing ecosystem. This is mathematically unsustainable, and yet we continue to live with this fiction and order our lives and order society around something that cannot be sustained. And it will lead to a crossroads of grave problems, environmental shocks, geopolitical shocks, and some very dark days potentially ahead. Hi. Wow. It's Mr. Happy. It is Doing Good my Friday. <laughs> He has risen. He has risen. I think very um, meaningful points that you have brought up. I think we probably have the most educated army of people working as baristas at Starbucks in the history of humankind. And so when you were talking about that, it made me wonder. I mean, I, as you uh, love the act of learning, love the, all, all the ritual and, and everything that goes with it, I really do. I love the smell of sharply fresh and sharpened pencils and all that good stuff and the book bag and going into the bookstores and you know meeting with the teacher right. and asking if I can do extra credit. Yes, I'm one of those nerds. Um, <laughs> but you know, the reality is, is that there's a difference between the love for learning and then someone going into school with the idea that I have to do this and complete this because I'm going to get a degree. Therefore, yeah. if I have a degree, I'm going to have a good paying job. Therefore, I can go to Disneyland seven times a year or Vegas or whatever it is or get a Lexus. That's a very different mindset. And the other thing I think that's problematic is that it's pretty much making the assumption that everybody wants to go to college. And even though I may not understand why someone wouldn't go to college, I respect and realize that there are people who don't. That's just, that's not how they learn. That's not the environment they want to be in. Maybe they don't feel that they have the funds. Maybe they want to do hands-on. Maybe they want to be a, an apprentice. I mean, there are many ways to learn. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be in a little box and have a really big receipt and do mass quantities of reading. There's many ways to learn. So um, I'm not even sure if that's a question. I think that's I'll just a statement. Well, Thank you. <laughs> uh, that br uh, brings up the question of compulsory mass schooling. Mm -hmm. We think it's natural and inevitable, but it's only been around for about 100 years. Since the Industrial Revolution. Since the Industrial Revolution, when we needed to create docile workers and compliant consumers. And we, as, as people moved from the countryside to the towns and the industrial base shifted from uh, agriculture to the economy, we created compulsory mass schooling. And it's different state by state, but most states, 14, 16, 18, and then you, you can stop. But I would, I'd like to propose a more radical solution. <gasps> radical. Let's eliminate compulsory mass schooling. Wow, because, that is pretty radical. Yeah, because like you said, uh, people Fox learn... Network will never have you on their show. <laughs> I, and I don't want to be the token Hannah, or the token Combs liberal. Hi, I'm the shrinking violet liberal. No, like you said, uh, people learn through apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. People learn through project-based education, yeah. hands-on stuff. People learn out of schools. People used to be in trades. I mean, if your family were a bunch of blacksmiths, guess what you're probably going to be? Why not bring some of the old ways back. Why assume that because compulsory mass schooling has existed in our lifetimes, in our parents' lifetimes, that it needs to stick around forever? Yeah. Uh, society keeps changing, culture keeps changing, and education reflects that change and also creates that change, as media does. And why can't we imagine different possibilities for education? Why can't we imagine how education could be an engine for a sane future instead of an insane future? And I think we should dare to think sanely. 
I think we should dare to go to break and let you think about that dare. A double dog dare you to think sanely and stay around for part three of The Art of Life. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on the Think Tech Digital Series. The show is every Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and I want you to watch this show because I think that when we talk with artists on the show about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, why they do it, I believe that it resonates within each of us and we find something inside of ourselves that brings us closer to all of humanity. That's what arts are there to do, and that's what I'm here to do on this show. That's Center Stage. It's on every Wednesday from 2 to 3 o'clock. I hope to see you there. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Hi, my name is Sachiko Slomas. I'm the floor manager of Think Tech Hawaii here. Uh, you can join us on the air every weekday from 1 to 5 or off the air at thinktechhawaii.com. We stream all of our videos and all of our amazing, like, amazing shows ho, 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 at thinktechhawaii.com or on our Ustream channel. You can also check us out on Twitter at ThinkTechHI or Instagram at ThinkTechHI also. I'll be listening and I hope to see you there. Thanks. Aloha. It's such a shame you can't hear what we say in the break because sometimes it's just the choices of the choice. But don't worry, we're not going to cheat you. There's all kinds of interesting things. This is part three of The Art of Life with my guest, Dr. Boyce Brown, educator, activist, Politico on the fringes, berserkly grad or yeah. diazin. Wow, yeah. local boy living in Kalihi like that. Ooh, Rada, you got some <laughs> cred going on. Uh, we were discussing all of these things about how there needs to be a paradigm shift. What? Look it up. That's what your Google's for. Um, but that things are sometimes are cyclical. Cyclical. Can I speak English today? Cyclical. But sometimes that they change. Change is the only constant, as wise people have noted. So we talked about one of the major shifts, which was at the end of the Industrial Revolution, this attempt or this maybe successful effort to standardize and make schooling mandatory for the youngins and the children. Um, and that was a, a, a direct reflection of people moving from farms and and the urbanization of rural places and the building of factories and what have you, which before there was mandatory schooling, the people working in a lot of those factories were kids. You don't believe me? Watch Gangs of New York. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's amazing to think that small children, it was perfectly fine, and you know, that's what they did. Then they went to school, and that's what became the norm. I think on the adult side of things, people just assume that if you have a job and you work there for 40 years, at the end of your run, you get a gold watch and a you know, retirement party. Well, news update, nobody gets a gold watch. And I don't know if anybody stays at a job for 40 years anymore because that type of what we would define as job security doesn't even really exist unless you're a one percenter. So we have definitely uh, incurred a lot of changes in within our society and certainly economically. So it would beg and encourage a change within the system of the educational um, structure. So is there resistance to it, or what do you see? Be a seer for us. Look into the crystal ball. Well, I am a prophet and a seer. So in your own, you know, prophet in their own town is never appreciated. Cassandra was mm -hmm. always right. Always. Uh, 
I think you're pointing to something about how society shifts with the economic basis, and I would say that that's very true in a lot of fields and certainly in standards-based education. In 1973, we worked the least amount of hours as workers that we would ever work, and it's been rising steadily since then. And about that time, we went off the gold standard, which, which made uh, the U.S. dollar be a fiat currency valued for nothing more than the collective agreement that it has value. In 1983, we switched from being a net creditor nation to a net debtor nation, and we hollowed out our manufacturing base from a high of about 45% of GDP right after World War II to now it's, I think, around 15%. And so all of these trends are often lumped together in something called post-industrialism. And I think that standards-based education is part of the ideological shockwaves or bulwarks, perhaps, uh, that came out of, of post-industrialization. And that's when you started seeing in the 80s uh, the crisis rhetoric. The schools are in trouble. Everybody help them. And there was a decade of reports in the 80s about the crisis of, um, of American education, starting with this really great report, A Nation at Risk, in 1983. And that, I think, if you want to be cynical, and I occasionally am, which is just a way of saying I'm honest, is that the businesses, the big business, the Fortune 500 people that led this uh, crisis rhetoric drive, they wanted to refashion education in such a way to socialize their job training skills, uh, job training costs, and privatize the benefits. And I think that's one of the most nefarious things about uh, post-industrial capitalism, which I might call transnational global kleptocracy or transnational global uh, socialism, because it socializes the costs and privatizes the benefits into the 1%, leaving us as automaton worker bees who think that if we just get that degree and just get that 80 grand a year job, we can possibly be happy just working till six, coming home, watching TV, taking that two week vacation a year until you, the conveyor belt to death reaches its destination. And if education doesn't change, it will further entrench that death wish that society has today. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's the State of the Union. It sounds kind of grim. Give us a silver lining. What's the, what's the solution, my friend? You well, have this book. I know there's got to be some ideas in there. It can't just be a study. You, do you offer us some a glimmer of hope? No, I don't. And I'll tell you why. No, uh, <laughs> I think America, because we have this, and we're, this is the kingdom of Hawaii. This is not America. We have a solutionitis. We always want to think of what's the solution, what's the solution? And sometimes there is none. Sometimes it's just going to go to hell in a handbag. But I like a handbasket, but you know. <laughs> well, I'm sure you have some nice handbags. <laughs> You're a, a fashionista. But uh, the answer is, always, is, is obvious and eternally the same, collective action. Mm -hmm. And Would that be revolution? I gotta give a shout out for my mom. She's been saying for 25 years now, every time that there's some hiccup uh, socially, she says, I'm telling you, mark my words, there's gonna be another revolution in this country. She never is specific to say what will be the crux to, to bring forth that action, but it's kind of like the frog in the pot and the heat just being turned up very slowly. Like, she feels that it's inevitable that something Finally, people will wake up and want to demand some type of action. I don't know. Willow's mom, you're right. Think <laughs> Tech Hawaii listeners and viewers to the barricades. <laughs> Sharpen your pencils. <laughs> Sharpen your crayons. Even little kids can revolt. Oh my goodness. The peasants are revolting. <laughs> In many ways. <laughs> What's that smell? <laughs> 
But seriously, what do you so collectivism? Would that be going about it in a legislative way, writing your senator, signing off on you know change.org, or taking to the streets, or grassroots, or talking at a PTA meeting, or voting your conscience, or uh, would that be boycotting people that you think you know they don't fall into accordance with your ideals and ideology with your dollar? What's what's the solution? I know you said we, <laughs> it was, that sometimes there is a solution, well, but. I agree with your mom. Yeah. I think there will be a revolution at some point because mm -hmm. the economic, environmental, and geostrategic problems are backing up so severely and so quickly that it will snap. Says Paul. Yeah. And when it snaps, the people, having lost the ability to utilize print-based rationality, will react like spoiled children, and there will be a, a period of chaos. But when we rebuild the social forms, and political forms, as we will have to, we will realize that elective politics, politics that assume the nation state, they didn't work. Yeah. They're no longer functional. So we will have to reimagine so many things. And I think it's inevitable. It may sound utopian at this point, but I think it's inevitable that we will move towards anarchy and anarchy has a bad rap oh disorder chaos no anarchy is self-government at the lowest level possible i think counties are an adequate level i think watersheds are an adequate level how different is that than libertarians because i think they use a similar definition but they definitely avoid the anarchy word i think libertarians are still uh beholden to the nation state concept and, and libertarians are not the same as as tea party people just to be clear about that as well there's a lot of overlap there's some overlap there's, there's a, a little of... venn diagram going on there well, my my political belief is a chaotic venn diagram of about nine different philosophies but uh, <laughs> it's what keeps, keeps me so it's a spirograph in your brain yeah but no i think if we take our responsibility to future generations seriously and if we take our responsibility to the biosphere seriously we'll realize that we need to control water power sewage trade at the lowest possible level the ahupua'a based system of the the native hawaiians was very effective in having a uh, self-sustaining economy and for those of your viewers who don't know, ahupua'as are a, typically a pie-shaped wedge that go from the mountains to the sea, a subdivision of land. And so you had mountain, mountain products, mountain people, ocean products, ocean people. And within that unit, they were relatively autonomous and uh, self-sufficient. And I think we are of necessity going to have to return to a model something like that. Because right now, we have 10,000 mile supply chains from China bringing us our goodies and international trade based on $50 a barrel oil. And we've passed peak oil. Peak oil is this concept that you've taken out half of the oil that's in the ground. We have, and there will be a moment when it's more expensive and uses more energy to take a barrel out than it is from what you get. And when we hit that, uh, moment we can't get our stuff from China on these super tankers anymore we're gonna have to get it locally and the more that we can start modeling these behaviors and modeling these types of communities the better because they will lead the way so even though I mocked American so solutionitis I too think that we need to look for solutions and one is to start doing those models and one effective means might be charter schools because they're allowed, they're given public money but a lot of autonomy to create their programs. And as a school administrator, I've administrated at a lot of charters, but it's not like, here's a report. I work with the community, I work with different nonprofits, community based organizations to create multi service, holistic uh, service delivery of to fill needs that the community identifies itself. And so any model that takes us lower 
helps us work in harmony uh, more to the grassroots is a good one. And there and are models... the opposite of what we're working with today. Which, instead of decentralizing it and figuring out what the community needs, Fortune 500, through its surrogates... It's top down. It's top down. Yeah. And wow. it's proven that it, it won't work, so why do we keep doing it? Well, I'll tell you what I think we got to keep doing. we got to have you on the show again. Because oh, we've yeah. run out of time. It's the worst part of the show, which is why we run out of time, because now we're getting to the yummy, juicy stuff. But Dr. Revolt! <laughs> think that Hawaii viewers! Sharpen your pencils! Sharpen your crayons! Dr. Boyce Brown in the house. You can follow up all about this on the Art of Life with Hula Chang Facebook page. Friend us, like us, all that good stuff. We'll put some links to his book and his writings and all what have you. And we will see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend.